Good evening and thank you for being with us. After a two-month election campaign, the Anishinaabeaski Nation has elected a new Grand Chief. 41 of the 49 Nan Chiefs cast their votes earlier today, and the results were announced live during the annual Kiwewin Conference. And the results are that uh, Derek Fox received 30 votes and Bruce Shishi received 11 votes. Therefore, Derek Fox has been elected as Grand Chief of Anishinaabeaski Nation. After spending the past six years as a deputy Grand Chief, Derek Fox from Bearskin Lake secured the votes necessary to become the new leader of NAN. Fox will serve a three-year term, succeeding Alvin Fiddler, who stepped down this year. He was sworn in in an official ceremony earlier this afternoon. I, Derek Fox, undertake the duties of the office of the Grand Chief of Anishinaabeaski Nation. I solemnly promise and sincerely pledge to fulfill these duties to the best of my abilities as they are outlined in our charter. Three Deputy Grand Chiefs were also elected today. Anna Betty Achini Paneskum and Bobby Narcisse received the most votes on the first ballot. Well, a two-way tie for the third position needed to be broken with a second ballot. Victor Linklater was then voted in as the third Deputy Grand Chief by a vote of 24 to 15, capping off the NAN election. Meanwhile, rumors are swirling a federal election could be called as early as this Sunday. Thunder Bay Superior North incumbent Patty Haidu will only say that she's ready to defend her seat in Parliament. The Health Minister insists she doesn't know when the election will be called, but she did post this to social media yesterday morning, indicating that door-to-door -door canvassing has now begun. Haidu says as the declared Liberal candidate, she needs to be ready for the writ to drop at any time. Politics isn't a one-time event. It's really about continuing to connect with people in the riding, talking to members of all of the different communities that Thunder Bay Superior North encompasses and trying to understand the needs of the North as they evolve and um, as we get through this pandemic and the many other challenges and opportunities that our region uh, presents. Haidu will be challenged by NDP candidate Chantelle Bryson, Conservative Joshua Taylor, Amanda Modijong with the Green Party and Rick Danes for the People's Party of Canada. Back Seoul Police and the OPP are investigating a sudden death on the First Nation located near Sioux Lookout. First responders were called to a home in Fisherman's Head early Monday morning regarding a woman in medical distress. 50-year-old Wanda Beardy was pronounced dead soon after. The OPP's major case investigation team and other units are looking into the circumstances of the death and they're asking anyone with information to come forward. A neighboring township man and his wife are lucky to be alive after their vehicle was destroyed by a one in a million lightning strike. This is what happened to Andy Agaran's truck as it was traveling down the Trans-Canada Highway west of Richer, Manitoba at around one o'clock Monday afternoon. The lightning apparently hit the truck's radio antenna. The voltage from the lightning bolt then shorted out the vehicle's electrical system and started a fire in the truck's dashboard. Deputy Fire Chief David Wright says the lightning doesn't usually strike a moving vehicle. This is just a very strange, uh, unusual thing that, uh, you know, that occurred. But, you know, we're just thankful that nobody was injured. And Agaran told Winnipeg Media that he saw a bright blue flash and the truck shut down immediately. He then managed to slow down and pull it off the highway. They had just minutes to escape safely. The truck is a complete write-off and the couple has now rented a vehicle to continue their journey to Calgary to visit family members. Thunder Bay OPP are looking for tips from the public following a collision between a tractor trailer and a pedestrian this morning. It happened at around 8 o'clock at the corner of Highway 61 and West Arthur Street. The male pedestrian's head was struck by the passing transport and he was rushed to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Anyone with information about the tractor trailer unit is being asked to contact the OPP. There are two more new COVID-19 cases being reported today by the Thunder Bay District Health Unit. It is the third straight day with new cases. Both of the infections are from the Thunder Bay area. One comes as a result of travel outside of northwestern Ontario, while the other exposure source is unknown. There are still five active cases in the district as two have been resolved since yesterday. On the vaccine front, the district now has hit a major milestone, according to the health unit. 
More than 100,000 people are now fully vaccinated against the virus. And Ontario is reporting 324 new COVID-19 cases today. 324 of those are in people who are not vaccinated, while 32 others have just one dose of the vaccine. This comes as Ontario unveils new isolation guidelines based on vaccination status. Colin DeMello has more. As Ontario prepares for the fourth wave, vaccinations have opened up the province to a new set of circumstances, even as cases continue to edge up. There's no need to panic. What we just need to be aware of now is this will be a pandemic of the unvaccinated now. It is those who are unvaccinated that could face the greatest challenges in the days to come, not only with the virus itself, but also with isolation rules. CTV News has obtained new guidance on what to do if you're exposed to COVID-19, and the rules vary based on vaccine status. Those who are unvaccinated would have to isolate for a minimum of 10 days and require two negative COVID-19 tests seven days apart. Household members who are unvaccinated would also have to self-isolate. But fully vaccinated Ontarians face a different set of rules. If you're exposed but asymptomatic, you would only monitor symptoms for 10 days and would not be required to get a test. Vaccinated household members would not have to isolate either. Symptomatic individuals who are fully vaccinated would have to isolate for 10 days only if they're COVID positive, but they could leave home after 24 to 48 hours if they're negative. Healthcare experts say the vaccine is ultimately what makes the difference. If you are vaccinated, you pick up COVID, you are less likely to transmit it to somebody who isn't vaccinated. And one of the reasons is that period who, the people who have been vaccinated the period in which they're infective and can transmit virus is generally going to be shorter. There are cautions, however, that thousands of young Ontarians under the age of 12 are currently not eligible. Meaning all the parents should get vaccinated, all the school staff should get vaccinated, and we can't, you know, just let case numbers grow too high. To prevent that, some in the medical community say the province needs to clarify whether vaccines will ever be mandatory for frontline workers. As we do continue to see case counts rise, it will be vital for uh, Dr. Moore and uh, the province uh, to make very clear uh, you know, an overall provincial vaccine policy. Uh, there may be certain settings that are uh, more amenable uh, to requiring or to uh, having uh, vaccinations as part of the foundation, uh, and certainly school settings are one that are being uh, you know, discussed. The province has so far rejected the idea of mandatory vaccinations. Repairs are continuing at one of the two magnetic resonance imaging machines at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre. According to hospital officials, one of the clinical magnets went down on July 31st, leaving the MRI program operating at half capacity. The malfunction required a repair involving significant parts being shipped in from Germany along with a specialized team to install those parts. The MRI in question was initially installed back in 2013. Hospital officials expect it to be fully operational and back in service sometime in the next three days. Affected MRI patients are being notified regarding any rescheduling that may be necessary. The city of Thunder Bay is finding new locations to use fake grass along the sides of city streets. After a successful trial run along a section of Balmoral Street in the past few years, the city is now installing the green artificial turf at the new Edward Street roundabout. Alex Flood reports. It may not be the real stuff, but artificial turf is breaking through as a sustainable option to act as a grass replacement. Unlike regular grass, artificial turf can withstand winter degradation and rainwater will easily seep into the ground rather than adding to the stormwater system. The aesthetic of the turf was also a driving factor behind the Balmoral Street installation. And as city project engineer Mike Vogrig tells us, these benefits should pay off as they lay down more artificial grass. So we have two more phases at Balmoral all the way to Beverly. So the next uh, phase will go down to Lithium and then from Lithium to Beverly. Uh, the current design right now has uh, the turf and the boulevards all the way down, uh, so we're continuing to use it. Uh, the first section's worked out really well, and it, and, uh, and it seems to be continuing to work out well, so um, that's going to happen uh, through till Beverly. 
On top of the Balmoral projects, the city's ongoing roundabout construction at Edward and Redwood is also undergoing turf installation. The artificial grass will add a slicker look to the roundabout's islands while providing the same weather system advantages. The city considered other alternatives like asphalt and permeable concrete, but artificial turf was the only option that properly supported a drainage system while remaining affordable. Although there's no additional turf project scheduled, artificial grass now serves as a viable option for the future. Any sort of like future projects or remaining streets, it's, it's, it's kind of like another tool in the toolbox to how to treat boulevards. Uh, so like on a case by case basis, we'll probably take a look at them and rather than just thinking about asphalt or grass or maybe a concrete boulevard, uh, it's, it's another tool that we have depending on the conditions of that particular street and that project. After the turf is installed, city sweepers will come by to maintain it several times a year to clear debris without damaging the artificial grass. Vogrig says it's a long-term solution that benefits pedestrians and drivers and leaves a positive impact on the environment. Alex Flood, TBT News. Three men, including two Toronto residents, have been arrested in the latest drugs and firearms bust by city police. It came after officers made a traffic stop on Pearl Street Tuesday afternoon. A search of the vehicle turned up crack cocaine, cash, and a loaded handgun. A further search found that one of the men was also in possession of a quantity of fentanyl. All three are facing drug and firearms charges. While well, the province reported six new forest fires last night in the northwest region, bringing the total number of active fires around here to 115. Some localized rain has provided some relief in recent days, and there's also been a lot less smoke wafting into the Thunder Bay area. Rachel Wood, a registered nurse at Northern Respiratory, says that clients who are more at risk are starting to breathe better. With the rain that we've had recently, that's definitely helped um, reduce the smoke in the area. So people are starting to feel better and able to get out a little bit more. Um, I always tell people, just listen to your body. Um, if you're having a really bad day with your breathing, get more short of breath, definitely limit your activities that day. While the fumes continue to blow in from the west, the severity of the smoke is far less noticeable than what the district experienced just a few days ago. And although the fresher air brings a sigh of relief for now, Wood has some tips for local residents if and when the air quality worsens once again. What we try to tell people is to reduce exposure to the smoke. Um, so it's important to stay indoors on those days when the air quality is really poor. Um, to stay indoors and um, close all the windows, close your doors. If it's really warm, use an air conditioner, but ensure you... Um, close the fresh air vent on that so you're not drawing in any added smoke into the home. Anyone experiencing shortness of breath or other respiratory issues should contact their local health care provider. And local pickleball players finally have a dedicated outdoor venue in Thunder Bay to call their own. A major project to revamp the old tennis courts at Boulevard Lake is now complete with four courts created specifically for pickleballers. The $350,000 project wrapped up this past weekend with many upgrades such as removing the old asphalt to install a proper base, adding new asphalt, brand new fences and a new resting area. The court area is split in half with one side being specifically for two tennis courts and the other adding the four pickleball courts for the game that's grown in popularity in recent years, especially with seniors. City Parks planner Werner Schwar says there's the potential for even more pickleball carts around the city of Thunder Bay soon. We already have tennis courts surrounded by the city and, and many of them also are, are multiple court facilities. So say for example like County Park where I think we have four courts or Waddington where we're also, I think we also have four. In the future when we redo it, it may make sense to have more dedicated pickleball. The tennis players we spoke to at Boulevard today say they're very happy with how the new project turned out. Ever played pickleball? 